You mean because we don't see nothing? Good? Much better for me. Started. Oh, we can start. It started. Can we share our screen? Yes. Mm, Helinda, you can start. The start session is live now. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, can everybody see my screen? Can somebody let me know if you can see my screen? It seems a bit dark to me. We're all good on okay. this one. Right, can somebody there just give me the heads up, the thumbs up that we're ready to go? Are we ready to go? Yes, yes. Yes, yes we're ready to go. Okay, be. so uh, it's with great pleasure that uh, we have the opportunity pr to present from the maintenance working group uh, today, thank you for accommodating our um, the fact that we're not there. We really would love to be there, obviously, um, but we're very glad that Marcus Stumpner is there and will answer all the difficult questions that come up today. So, uh, Marcus, pay attention. So, this presentation is in two parts. I'm going to give a very short overview of the working group, uh, less only a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to flip to Caitlin and she'll share her screen and she'll go through in detail, probably one of, the more, one of the more exciting bits of work we think to have come out of the maintenance working group. So I'm here to talk to you briefly about the maintenance reference ontology. Thank you to CERM for the introduction. And I'd also like to start by acknowledging um, the people that turn up every other week to talk to us about this and help us. Um, Matt Selway um, and Marcus from Adelaide, Caitlin, without whom none of this would happen, and then of course Will and Chris and Farhad, who are regulars on our calls, as well as many others who drop in in an ad hoc way. We acknowledge thank and thank you for all the work. So we have approached the maintenance working group reference ontology in a quite different way, I think, to the other working groups. What we have actually done is we've gone and developed four application ontologies with data and real world problems. And one of those, the maintenance activity ontology, Caitlin is going to talk to you about today. So in each of these cases, we have developed uh, classes and axioms and, 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 often, and, and have a real use case and competency question and industry data. They are four discrete pieces of work. What we've then done, and across them, we probably have 50 or 60 classes. But we asked ourselves, uh, from each of these four uh, application ontologies, one for state, one for failure modes and effects analysis, one for procedures, and one for activity, we asked ourselves, uh, which, of, which terms did we use more, two or more times in these ontologies? So if we're using, if we're reusing a term in the activity ontology in the state ontology or vice versa, then in our mind that belongs in the reference ontology. And so our reference ontology is a very small ontology, only uh, 17 or 18 terms, but the rule for getting into that ontology is it has to be used in two or more of our application ontologies. So this is a, uh, a picture. The ontology is up in the maintenance dev um, IOF site uh, on, on GitHub, so people can have a look at it. We have had a first pass at the annotations. So we've done a number, I think we've uh, done annotations for almost all of our defined classes uh, using first order logic and semi-formal definitions. And we are going back to try and put some more meat on the bones of the primitive classes. So um, not all of the super classes are shown here because it gets a bit messy. Um, but you can see I've shown it just as a couple of examples of where we link into IOF or we might link in directly uh, to BFO. And 
Uh, with maintenance, we really span the fact that we are dealing with functions and functional failures. We're dealing with uh, states that trigger events to happen. We're dealing with maintenance activities. And of course, we're dealing with qualified people and procedures. So as I said, there are many more terms in this we, that we've developed in the course of our work, but we're only in a reference ontology. We've tried, we've actually tried to adhere to the 20 term limit that everybody else was supposed to adhere to when we first started this. So um, what's coming next for us, uh, as you can see here, we've got the maintenance working group reference ontology. We very much hope that that will be released by the end of the year and obviously support um, looking forward to the support and input of others as we go through the approval process. In the course of building the application ontologies, we've seen the opportunity for a number of other small modular ontologies, and you can see that they're listed there. So we're going to be working on that, and we're also going to be giving some thought to how to make patterns to make our ontologies much easier uh, to use and accessible. So that's all I have now. I'm not going to take any questions at this time. I'm just going to go straight to Caitlin. And then maybe we'll take some questions at the end. Oh, cool. I'm just sharing my screen. Can everyone see that? Whoops, that's disappeared. One second. There we go. Can everyone see that? I can see it. Yep. Yeah. All right, great. Well, hi everyone. Um, my name's Caitlin Woods. I'm a student of Melinda's and I've been working uh, in the IOF maintenance working group uh, for, the, for the last three or four years now. Uh, so I'm going to be going through our ontology for maintenance activities, which is one of the um, application level ontologies that we made as part of our reference ontology work. Uh, and so this work has obviously come out of the maintenance working group and also represents a collaboration between the University of Western Australia and the University of South Australia. All right, so as Melinda mentioned, our approach to creating our maintenance reference ontology is to create these different ontology modules and tackle one problem at a time using real world industrial data. And in this case, we are looking specifically at maintenance activities and the value we can get out of maintenance activities. All right, so the real world industrial data that we're interested in in this case is maintenance work order records. So maintenance work order records are like medical records for assets. So a technician might go out to a site and identify a problem with a piece of equipment, say a pump has broken down and work needs to be done on that equipment. So they'll generate a maintenance work order record so to, to indicate that the work needs to be done. So that record will contain some structured data such as a date, uh, the functional location of the item that needs to be worked on. Um, and it will also contain an unstructured text field, for example, a short text field. And this contains information about what went wrong and what needs to be done. So for example, we have change out leaking engine, or calibrate pressure switch. And that's all the information that we get. But there's so much valuable data locked away in this short text field. Um, and one of those pieces of valuable data is the activity that was performed. So why do we need to know the maintenance activity? So activity information or what work was done is used to identify end of life events and determine when preventative actions were taken on particular equipment items. So we're not only getting a view of what's been planned, but we're also getting a view of the actual work that was done on the equipment. And that information is stored in this short text field. Um, so such information is crucial for the execution and feedback and development of an effective maintenance strategy. And the sorts of activities that we're talking about when I say maintenance activity is activities like repairs, replacements, and inspections. So therefore, because this is such a crucial piece of information, we really need to know what work was done on the equipment. We wanna make sure that that information is as accurate as possible when we're feeding that back into a maintenance strategy. So to do this, we've used an ontological approach and we've developed our reference level 
ontology, the maintenance activity reference ontology, and a series of other ontology modules uh, to support an application level ontology. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the modules at the end of the presentation. So how did we develop the maintenance activity reference ontology? The maintenance activity reference ontology contains um, seven core activities uh, that we determined are important activities in maintenance. And so to get what we what these seven core activities are, we took 600,000 maintenance work orders and extracted the activity terms from them using uh, natural language techniques that we've been developing over the years um, and normalised those those activities into a set of 230 maintenance activity terms. So from 600,000 terms, we got 230 terms, which is not an exhaustive set. It's a, it's a nice, relatively small set, but still too much to uh, create meaningful de definitions for. Um, so what we did, we clustered those 230 activities into groups of semantic synonyms. So for example, in this diagram, we can see that amend and align, we consider to be semantic synonyms of the activity adjust. And through this clustering exercise, we managed to reduce our list down to seven core terms that we believe are different from, that are distinguished from one another. And how did we distinguish these maintenance activities from one another? So we started by looking at uh, existing standards. So in particular, ISO 15926 part four, and ISO 14224. Both of these standards reference maintenance activities, um, but they're not completely aligned. Their definitions and their set of terms um, are, just, are just a bit different. Um, so we wanted a bit more information to sort of align these two ideas. Um, so we used a SME's understanding of how they distinguish between maintenance activities and also our existing work on maintenance state. So this is an understanding of uh, the state of an item before and after an action has been taken and the effects that that state has on the function of the item. Mm -hmm. And in creating our elucidations for these seven core activities, we focus on the following information with potential value to reasoning. So that is, is the activity initiated by a preventative maintenance strategy or is it corrective maintenance? Uh, is the item performing its required function? at the time that the activity is performed? Does the activity involve an action that restores the function? Um, does the activity change the function at all or the capabilities of the item? Um, and is the state or the maintenance state of the item known or unknown? So is it known that the equipment is in a failed state or an operating state before and after the action has been taken? So we created these elucidations for these seven core terms, and now we want to test that they're applicable by applying them to a real world industrial problem that we have. And so with our maintenance work orders, we have information such as the unstructured text, the item that's been worked on, um, whether the work order was corrective or preventative. And so we want to, to be able to test the data quality of these maintenance work orders by checking if the, the activity in the unstructured text matches the information in the rest of the work order and is consistent with what we expect to be of that activity. And so those are our competency questions. So for each of these activities, for a replace, for calibrate, for inspect, is what's in the unstructured text, text consistent with what's in the rest of the work order to say, okay, no, this is actually the activity that occurred. And so how do we look at the rest of the work order to see what activity occurred? Well, this is the logic that is taken by an expert when they do such an analysis. So at the moment, an expert has to go in and make these sorts of decisions. Is the labor cost greater than zero? If not, the work's not actioned, et cetera. Um, and we've created a workflow that we've encoded into our application level ontology. Um, and We've used our elucidations to um, figure out this workflow as well. Um, so this enables us to determine from information outside the unstructured text what activity has occurred. 
And so if the activity in the unstructured text matches the information in the rest of the work order as determined by this workflow, then we say, hey, there's no data quality issues in this work order. We can be relatively confident that this is the activity that actually occurred. Otherwise, we say, okay, something's off here. We need someone to look at this and make sure we know what activity actually occurred. And so how did the ontology perform? So we created a confusion matrix to show uh, that the ontology performed quite well against an expert identifying data quality issues from the work orders. Uh, so there were 16 texts that the expert identifies as having no data quality issues. And in 14 of these cases, so 88% of these cases, sorry, we analyzed um, 36 work orders in our evaluation. So in 88% of these cases, the ontology agrees. And one of the key issues in the work order short text is that sometimes they say something like pump failed, something's unserviceable. Um, it doesn't actually contain any text describing the actual activity performed. So for 12 of the records in the, in the test set, uh, and so 33% of them, the ontology was able to infer an activity that was performed with 100% agreement with the expert. Um, what could be improved? So in this work, in our clustering exercise where we created our seven core activities, we created a one-to-one -one mapping between um, a activity term and its semantic synonym. Um, however, we do recognize there could be potential ambiguities between activities in certain contexts, for example, in installs, like where, where does that fit in the, in the clusters? And uh, a second area that could be improved is the handling of temporal aspects of activities. So in this application ontology, we modeled the representative or possible participants in activities uh, as represented in the maintenance work order data. But if we had the data of a live view of the actual participants that um, took part in these activities, then we really could uh, infer more information about what activity was actual, actually performed. But we would need that data from industrial organizations to be able to do that sort of analysis. In the future, we hope to create more of these um, application level ontologies, as Melinda uh, mentioned, in order to inform our reference level maintenance working group ontology. And as part of this work, we've actually moved towards creating some of these application level ontologies. So we've, we've done this in a really modular approach. So for example, we've created um, a very basic work order ontology and, an, and a functional breakdown for pump ontology. And these can, modules can be used firstly by groups wanting to just work with these modules or could be used in our future work on uh, our, our maintenance activity, oh, sorry, our maintenance terms. All right, that's it from me. Um, I'll just stop sharing now. Right. So uh, um, I think hopefully that's a nice example of a real, I mean, data quality of maintenance work was a huge issue for industry. And to me, this is a nice example of, uh, you know, we start with a real problem that people are interested in. Um, whether these terms are right or wrong, it might be difficult to explain to the non-engineers in the audience, but whether something's replaced or not is a critical input into a mean time to failure calculation. And we use mean time to failure metrics in order to manage our assets. So using, being able to scale something like this over hundreds of thousands of work orders um, is where, instead of an engineer doing it every time they want to do a mean time to failure calculation is a huge, huge um, win, I think. And the ontology is, it's a really nice example, I think, but I'm keen to hear what others think. So any questions? Oh, I think there should be someone sharing the... Anybody can deal with the digital aspects? <laughs> Alan Marcus, you have to translate for me, us. That's, that's fine. Any questions from the audience? Eve. 
Yes, uh, <coughs> thank, thank you, Melinda and Kathleen, for your presentation from uh, the real problems of uh, maintenance. Uh, I have a question. You mentioned uh, small modules. Um, and uh, my question is, uh, how do you define these modules, the scope of the modules, and how small they, they should be? Did you get that? Yeah, so how do we define the scope of the modules and how small they will be? Um, I'm not sure that we have any rules around it, Caitlin, jump in, but to me, we defined the classes we needed to solve the problem. Um, we formed those into modules, and in time, we will lift up common terms out of those modules into the reference ontology if necessary. Do you have anything to add to that, Caitlin? Yeah, um, so that's the modules um, for the core. So, yeah, we choose a problem and the module resolves around, revolves around that problem, like Melinda suggested. And then within that problem, we find further modules, such as the work order ontology that we found in the maintenance activity work. And we choose those modules just by considering how things are logically grouped in maintenance. Um, yeah. And something we're going to want to reuse, like we use work orders all the time. Why on earth would we make a work order ontology? Why on earth would we make a, a whole bunch of new classes when every time we wanted to use a work order, get, pull information from a work order? We already want to have the classes that say functional location, date, cost, all of those things. Makes a nice standalone module mapped in a way to the data source. But, uh, just uh, an additional question when yeah, you mentioned speak up a bit so they can hear what you're doing. Application uh, ontologies you mentioned. Uh, do you, is there the idea to map uh, uh, the models from applications to, to, to these modules? For, for uh, you know, you have models in applications, uh, you, you have in legacy systems in, uh, in industry, and uh, do you make, uh, uh, try to make mapping, or do you infer some uh, new modules from, from what is in, in a concrete application, or do you make mapping with existing small modules? I don't know that I really follow the question. I, I, we're very use case driven at this point in time. Like we had a specific use case, um, the maintenance procedure ontology or the maintenance activity um, ontology. So we're not driven by the data. We're driven by the use case. No, but maybe the question is linked. There are some existing maintenance softwares yes. from a company with plenty of terms and so on. And is there a link between, for example, BMA, which is the IBM software, and your ontology? Is that the question? Yes, it is. Yeah, oh, okay. You want Sorry, to Marcus, I just wanted to say that we're using, I mean, we pull mainly from SAP or Maximo. So SAP and Maximo both have work orders. We're not wedded to the terms they've used to describe those fields. We may well have given them a term that makes sense to us. <laughs> but we can map from their field into our ontology. I would add to, to his original question, the point that, as Melinda said, the modules are not determined by size, right? They're determined by classic software engineering decisions, which is coupling and cohesion. What is the coherent relationships between the classes in a module and how do they connect to the outside? And that's how you group them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we, by the way, I would say that I do like the idea of, I would like to see the IOF move along with small modules that are interoperable and reusable. Any other questions? So, do, does it mean that you would, yeah, would, would like to have some use case that are well defined to to create those small modules? Well, obviously, we're totally use case driven. There's no shortage of use cases. But within that, as you say, we have a maintenance application use case. But within that, we haven't developed one huge maintenance application ontology. We've developed four ontologies. And together, they form the maintenance application ontology. Maintenance activity, sorry.
Yeah. Yeah. Another question: Do you do you have also use case where you use uh, a bunch of uh, of uh, small modules? And, uh, do you? I mean, uh, you can have a use case where you need uh, uh, data from uh, uh, which are modeled in different in different uh, according to different small modules, and uh, how you how you operate this, or do you? Yeah. Do you have any uh, feedback about this uh, such experience of using uh, together different small modules? Yeah, so that was the case uh, with the activity ontology. We used um, terms from the maintenance state ontology. And so the ability to levitate those terms up to the reference level um, made it really easy to combine those two application ontologies. Mm. Yeah, it looks like that that's exactly the methodology that we've used, you know. Yeah. Examples already. Yes. Uh, I have a question. I do I, it's not really related to the ontology work, but uh, I was wondering on how you do the natural language processing of those uh, work orders. I mean how do you extract so should we just get the, the post tag or do do a more extensive work of, of analysis? One of the last question. question. No, you yeah, can't. well I have a I have a crack. So first of all, NLP is a huge field. And we do something called TLP, which is technical language processing. So anybody out there who is dying and, and gets a bit enthusiastic <coughs> and goes and gets some typical NLP used by Amazon and Twitter on their data and then applies it to engineering data is in for a shock. So we use the big deep learning models that, that, are, that are available in the embedding models, but we have to adapt them and we adapt them to engineering text through some very extensive work on annota annotations. So we've invested heavily in um, Produ producing gold standard annotated data sets in order to train models to recognize engineering terms. And so we have many, many papers on this and many free resources on our sites. So if this is an area that interests you, please reach out to us. I also think it's an area the ontology community has to pay more attention to because so much useful information is in unstructured text and you can't access it unless you can um, uh, tokenize it and and do some sort of entity named entity recognition on the unstructured text. I'm going to let Caitlin add anything she wants to now. No, that's perfect. I will contact you for sure because that really interests me. So thank you. Yeah. So I would I would say that named entity recognition, I think this is something the matching of the pipeline of doing the named entity recognition and having good tokenization for industrial text and matching that seamlessly into the ontologies and making sure that the entities you're naming, you have to choose names, are, are ontologically consistent with how you want to use them is, is I think, a really important part of, of what we're doing. And it would be nice to see the IOF entities driving the natural language processing token selection. Charles Leclerc from Total Energy. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the ISO standard showing the T67. You mentioned uh, 14 to 2 floor as a standard uh, for reliability and maintenance that can uh, allow a certain level of uh, definition of the functional and physical components of uh, your product. Uh, you said that uh, it doesn't match really the level of granularity and detail you want to work with. And do you have any loop of uh, feedback regarding the instance you are dealing with to promote some additional typicals or to, to define, in fact, more clearly some uh, additional uh, breakdown of uh, components and uh, main division. Okay. So do you plan this kind of loop of feedback to promote some typical shared 
at the level of the, I would say, domain ontology. I think I got that. I, what I understood you to say was we mentioned that there had been some inconsistency in how 14.224 and 15.926 had each defined their activity terms. We actually have a table in a paper that shows that they some of the terms are the same. They use the same word, but uh, but the definition is slightly different or they use the same word and the definitions are the same or they use different words. So there isn't a perfect match between those two. I do think that, and none of them have clearly distinguishable definitions. So they're just natural language definitions. I would hope that the fact that we have first order logic definitions for all of the terms we've used could be something that is useful for the standards bodies to go back and revisit. But that's a very long process in trying to get a standard to relook at the terms and definitions that have been in there since 1996 is maybe a battle that will be somebody else's. Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. I'm looking for uh, how to enable the promotion of the envelope loop to the ISO standard. And if we can uh, develop a kind of uh, staging in between because the process of feedback uh, to the level of ISO is very long process. And so mm -hmm. the opportunity with the flexibility of uh, semantic technology to promote through non commands or uh, IOF layer something in between and uh, we can comment and uh, we can uh, promote champion and progressively align together as a community that was the idea yeah so can i just comment on that one of the things i would really like to see as an outcome of the iof work is that with our very um thoughtful and formal definitions that we are doing in order to support reasoning, that those will indeed feed back into the ISO standards community. I think that has potential value. Um, and there also may be a mechanism. ISO has just started a big uh, JTC project about aligning terms semantically across the ISO family of standards. Um, and this would be a nice place to start. I'm sure they've got other things they want to do first, but um, certainly for activity terms, just to align those would be a very nice thing to do across the ISO family. Any more questions? We're still about 10 minutes ahead of time. So there are actually three hosts listed in the program for this session. You're one of them, Melinda. Um, well, Marcus, you are in loco parentis for me. That, that is correct. So how do we want to proceed? Um, can, we, can we go on with the next presentation? Yeah. We have more time for the time. Yeah, very good. Um, Alan, you want to come up? So I think we hop out of here now and go back to just watching, I think. Thank you very much to everybody for the questions and thanks, Marcus, for hosting us. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That's the session. Just wanted to make sure I'm sharing the right session. We need a technical person. Let's see if we can get a little screen. Once I can try, because yesterday it does not. Who is presenting? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you can follow me and come down. Yeah, I'll come down. I'm just trying to make sure it, it looks okay. <coughs> We're good to go. Um, morning, everyone. My name is Pava. 
I work at Cronfield. Um, my background is uh, on destructive testing, inspections, maintenance, and currently do digitalization. Um, one of the key aspects we wanted to understand from the academic perspective is how do we enable uh, effective digitalization? Um, we were looking at uh, different success stories. So primarily our group is quite interested into the data journey. So we look at different data, how to extract knowledge from data, uh, whether it's an NLP, uh, I've got some examples, uh, or be it uh, a traditional uh, AI, ML, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, based approaches to uh, understand what we look at data and how. But as data could be anything, could be a time series data set, could be uh, an imaging data set, could be a signal data set. Uh, we look at both uh, non destructive testing and structural health monitoring data, um, and of course, condition monitoring data as well. So there are slight differences, and we look at a variety uh, of applications. Um, a little bit about Cranfield. Uh, and I thought we will talk about who we are. Um, we are an exclusively postgraduate research-led university, so we don't have regular teaching space. Uh, we do host an MSc program, but MSc programs, but the teaching is literally a semester, and then the students go into research projects. So what we do is directly into the application level. Uh, in simplistic terms, uh, if technology readiness levels are a map. Uh, we are somewhere between three and six. So we are not fully fundamental, but we can actually go higher. Um, I wanted to give you a collation of terms. It's easier for us to show uh, the entire range. Now, that is not just limited to the university as a whole. This is just within our center and more specifically where I work. Um, my area of work is all about that digitalization of through life manufacturing where we are looking at the entire life, um, be it manufacturing, maintenance. Uh, so anything from process uh, development conceptually through to actually creating the end product, uh, looking at perhaps uh, a value creation. Uh, how do we look at it as a business imperative? So uh, one of the biggest challenges we had to align for was not just on the Research Council perspective, which is the funding, the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, but we also had the Technology Strategy Board, which again support through the Horizon 2020 and other projects, where we look at technologies that are already in its incubation stages and how do we progress them. So we do do a lot of uh, uh, technology adaption. Um, where we sit is we take it up to the shop floor. We hand it over to them because of data trans data sharing policies, it gets very hard. Now, we're not just limited to uh, a physical asset only. We're also looking at digital assets. And what I mean by digital assets is all about complex systems, uh, anything that can help us understand, be it uh, a new shop floor layout, and how do we look at uh, resources? How effective are the equipments functioning, uh, including like uh, how people are moving around? Is that the effective way? So we've got specific areas. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail. So we do do the digital twin side of things. We do a lot of virtual reality, augmented reality, and that's where uh, the other part is. Um, I must note, I am the engineer stroke physics guy in my team. Everybody else is software. So half of the work, which, we, which I'm going to show, is a reflection from their perspective, uh, but does not mean it has to be interpreted. Uh, I just thought I'd put something there. These are some of the current funding bodies. Most of our work is industry funded um, and we do engage in different activities. We also do some executive learning. Uh, currently, I'm looking into digital tools development through an apprenticeship program, which is quite pioneering within the UK, where we do direct hands-on uh, experience and expertise to the local public. Um, and that's just a snapshot of what we do, okay? Um, I look at something like um, this at the end, uh, where I'm looking at process development, uh, product testing, uncertainty modeling, uh, any of those kind of aspects. How do we collect data remotely? How do we assess them? So there's a lot of uh, remote uh, data capture and analytics, which we do. Uh, we don't just stop there. We look at process simulations. 
uh, or actually uh, real-time data capture and post-processing. So uh, we look at uh, robotics as one end. I don't want to put another robotic arm, but we do have a few of them. We try and look at how to automate the processes. Now, in our aspect, we look at the maintenance as a trigger point where we've got an indication of fault kind or probably a, re a requirement. Then we go into the actual inspection stages, go on to do some maintenance activities, could be a repair, replace. I've got a, a schema which I can show you later on, uh, which is actually in line with what we've been talking all the time. And we also look at where different data points come in, the disparate data. So we saw uh, from, from our yesterday uh, a little bit of that. So we do a lot of those things. Now we don't just stop there. We also look at the operator's perspective. So on the top left, we're looking at the uh, the AR uh, augmented reality. Um, I want to call it augmented, but it's mixed reality in, uh, in a sense because some of the data is coming from the laboratories, which is physically in a different building to where we are based. So which means we are trying to experience that remote maintenance, remote uh, decision making. Uh, because our ethos is that, okay, if I have to go on the show, in, in the past when I was to do some inspections, I'll go to the uh, industry, capture data, come back, do the analysis, then report. That timeline is too much. Could we actually have the inspector in the field where he's actually setting up doing all of the regulations as per standards or procedures or written instructions? Uh, and then how do we capture that data? We can then the log be reflected directly as a calendar event. So we've also developed those kind of uh, automated inspection techniques where we include both human within the automation perspective. So we are looking at that human in the loop aspects as well and how quick and how improved our decisions can be. Because if I have to have uh, an expert to go to the location, do the data capture, do the analysis and come back, you're losing time. So for us in our uh, industry sector, we want instantaneous answers. So that's a little bit of a, 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 an idea. Um, and what we are doing is maintenance. I know it's a, a, it's a detailed graph, just focus on maintenance. This is the kind of our perspective of how we see the life cycle from concept all the way through to end of life. And the majority where we are focused on is on the maintenance side. And the key questions we're asking are, what are the repair technologies? Uh, how how do monitoring systems work? How do they compare and support the life of the asset? Now, having said what the life cycle is, I wanted to show even more focus just within the maintenance aspect where our center focuses uh, or my group of interest is. Uh, part of the work goes into MROs, uh, be it uh, aerospace, uh, 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 locomotive, uh, ship building. We just call it an MRO where we're looking at the maintenance, repair, and overall as an overall product. Uh, we do get different challenges where somebody calls up and says, uh, I want a very micro scale model or a MISO scale model of data uh, from a single crystalline uh, part. Do you know how you can model it? And then we went into a, a mode where we want to just go ahead and look at that micro scale, micro mechanics, what's happening, but not just looking at practical data, but simulating it, trying to use the similar data set, of course, with uncertainty, trying to look at the various metrics which the standards say. And how do we capture them? How do we propose that? How do we get that feedback? That's just an example. Or actually the repair process. So one of the things which I'm quite interested in and we're working currently is the use of collaborative robotics to perform a, a patch repair on a composite laminate. So we're looking at aerospace sector. So we want to say how we can support the future systems because they are not the easiest of the systems to repair. So that's one area. Or actually components to scale. So for me, my component could be um, literally at a micro to a nano scale through to a macro scale where it can be quite big. And so our delivery systems is something which we need to look at. Is it collaborative robotics? Is it a coordinated machine where we can actually bunk, uh, mount onto things? Or do we look at uh, these kind of siloed factory layouts where there is uh, a, a process which actually transfers the path from station to station to station, be it a conveyor system, be it any of those things. So, so we look at those kind of logistics. Uh, think about uh, baggage handling systems in an airport. Okay, That's the kind of our big vision where we are currently working. And what we're doing is collecting data at every single point from the existing infrastructure, trying to provide meaningful feedback by considering disparate data. We don't just look at one bit. 
Now, this is where we started and, and this is how we summarize what we do. But the business imperative is very important. And the key thing I wanna focus on is the availability. For us, it's not about uh, how best the performance is. Um, as an engineer, if you ask me, it has to be like the, the story of the light bulb. Uh, you know, it has to, it's, a, it's the pioneering of innovation that it can go for hours and hours together. But then there is that economy that drives it and there is that passion. And how do we promote this into a business? How do we create value uh, within the organizations? When do we know that my asset is ready to be retired? Do we just cling on to it? What is the benefit from that? Most people talk about technologies. Uh, I, I do talk about a few of these digital technologies, but then they are the third pillar for me. I look at efficiency. How do I improve my efficiency? How do I reduce my wastage? So we do a lot of uh, uh, value mapping activities, not just for new concepts, but existing concepts as a loop over time based on the insights we get from the field. So one of the things we are looking at is mobility as a service. So we use that uh, of um, how we can look at cars, for instance, how many of we actually use our cars 24 seven because it's supposed to be running, right? But majority of us take like probably an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening, that's it. My asset is sitting there, depreciating value, um, aging, of course, different times, which means do we actually need to own it? So these are the questions we are asking based on the data we see. How do we maximize that value? So that's the kind of questions we're looking at. Um, so what we are, and this is probably where I will stop because there's a lot of information what we do. I'll quickly skim through, but the, the issues we currently are here. We are looking at, okay, the first thing is, uh, what is it that I wanna know? Is it automation my interest? Because my assets are big, heavy, complex, Think about uh, a machine tool uh, system. How do I support it? Do I end up going through it or an aircraft engine? Because I've got uh, a policy which says, hey, I have to disassemble the aircraft more often. How do we then look at different things? What is the influence of industry 4.0? What's the inspection is itself? What type of data we have? What are the data structures? So this is just to give you a brand vision of what we are interested in. And the reason being that our shift in focus is this digital disruption. That's where we are aiming at, and everybody at some level understands and aligns it. And I worked with the ATI um, about five years, six years ago, part of looking at the two life aspects to just capture within the stakeholders what could be, and that's the result of that. Uh, it, it, I know there's a lot of debate about how you do that split, uh, where you say where the market barriers are, but that was a very business driven notion. And what we are trying to look at is these aspects of data analytics, technology, trust, and the mindset. We have actually pushed this to the industry side purely because of the, the way things are. And that is something which we wanted to look at because of this aspect of data sharing, the quality of data. Uh, the quality of data where we presented earlier as a team was about the actual data itself. Here we are talking about what is the type of data which is relevant to make the business decision and what impact it will make. Because yes, you'd like the capability, but that's where you need to be. Um, I think these are the different areas, and, and, and this is something which we are currently working on. Um, one of the things we wanted to understand is, how do you actually even look at a digital twin? What are the different components of a twin? Is it just a physical 3D model uh, of a physical asset? Is that where we start, or is that the dynamic, adaptiveness, but not just with the acquisition. What level of information can we actually look at? Now, this is a very high level philosophical, probably very conceptual level. And the reason why we're doing this is to look at multiple systems and how I can connect to information. What knowledge can I extract from individual areas? So if there's a generator from a turbine system through another turbine system, but in different sectors from wind to probably a traditional uh, power. Okay. Um, that's where I thought I should give you a little bit of heads up, um, a little bit of examples of different maintenance perspectives and twins we create. Uh, and that's the current level we are trying to work in. The same story, but represented slightly differently because we are trying to create this link 
causality and how we do it. So if I want to say, um, I want to know what it is. So there was a discussion earlier, Melinda mentioned about uh, the NLP side of things. We are doing this way of things. We go slightly differently where we talk to the stakeholders. What is it that they require? What is it they have in store? Can we create a knowledge base? How do we create a system? How to index their existing archaic database? How do we restructure their database? How can they extract that information? How do they present it? Uh, I don't want to call it a knowledge graph, but this is a kind of a graphical visualization we are creating. Now, none of this uses ontology at this stage, okay? I call it a taxonomy, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here, trying to show the people what we do goes in everywhere, and we want to learn. We want to be in that journey, trying to formalize things um, in a simplistic way. Sorry, that's the kind of the overall UML from the software perspective how we look at maintenance as a process, uh, what drives us, and our interest, or my personal interest, is in the root cause analysis. How do we look at it? Because one of the questions our organizations ask is, uh, there is a problem. We've exploited it, but it's expensive. How do we solve it? They're not even worried about failures anymore. That's, that's yesteryears. If it fails, so be it. I don't care, but I don't want it to fail. Can I do that predictive uh, assessment and how do we look at it? And I think that's some of the topics we discussed here as well. Um, I'm just going to go through that's the NLP process, image mining. I know that's my initial attempt at uh, how to look at an ontology, looking at the vehicle kind of uh, influence, but uh, it's not perfect. I'm working through it. Uh, but we do a little bit of imaging analysis. Uh, and that's the final slide I want to start. I wanted to show how the processes how different process data types or activity types can come in. How do we then look at different technologies? What levels of automation we need to do? And where we see could potentially be, and that's why I call it the proposal, okay? I had to really think about what to present to you guys to come and show that the knowledge is very clear. And we think that's where our development should be in the digital data management side of things where we're looking at the application level ontologies through to a formal ontology and how we can use it into our work, how can we influence the future um, of the decisions? Because currently, uh, it's just a tool. And I want to say it's as good as the person who designed it, not the other way around. With that, I um, end my session. Um, Feel free to ask me things. I know I rushed through a lot of information because there's even more information I can talk about, but this is just to give you a snippet of what different things we do. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just gone. Yeah. So, um, so sorry, but first of all, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, maybe I miss it because I am a little bit sleepy from last night. <laughs> <but> uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I didn't get it yet. Uh, what are, uh, are ontologies a practical solution to digitalizing maintenance? So I said what we do. I never once said what ontologies or anything I use. I've said where we are developing, where we are working on, what that is that the best way. I'm looking at the software perspective. Um, I try and go tell my industry, hey, philosophically, this is what it is. They will just come back and say, you know what? I want a bottle, that's about it. What happens, that's your headache. But the question we are asking is, does that in, um, improve our performance? Does that add more value to it? How do we then combine? I know um, us, uh, me and Hedy, we've had a different discussion on where we think it's potentially, but the, val the question I wanted to ask the community is, I'll be thinking about it because for me, it's the business aspect. If I've missed the business, it doesn't add any value for us. Um, currently, the way Cranfield works and how, where we are, uh, we don't have the luxury of uh, saying, yeah, we'd love to go and do this. And this is probably the most insightful conference in a, in a decade for me. The amount of information I've had in the last three days, and that's where I want to feedback. So the question goes back, would a process of looking at the digital data management 
solve our problems. Because currently we do have something, I call it a, a software way of doing an API or a syntax with how things are. We are approaching it, we are new at the journey, and that's our, why our question is that. Can I make a comment? So um, I, I think this is a build it and you hope they will come project. There, um, there are much, there are business problems all over the place. Obviously, every big organization that we work with, and we work with some of the really big oil and gas and uh, mining and process companies, this, they're all, um, you know, digitalization is a much overused word. If you if you want to do reasoning at scale, then you've you cannot start with something as big as this. It would be you know you will be do, you will be working on this from an ontological perspective for the next hundred years. Um, we've taken three years with all of the people in this room and elsewhere around the world, and we've come up with I don't know how many terms terms said in IOF core fifty seven. It's taken us three years. Um, and, and yet you're implying that none of the rest of us have a business case. And yet our data quality project for the maintenance activity has a huge business case, a productivity business case and a reliability business case. So there are many um, ways. It, you can't start to build something as huge as this with because you will take so long to deliver value. The way to deliver value is to have small deliverable pieces on the on the way that add value that when you are finished provided you've got a good plan you end up building something that deals with the whole system but i don't think you can start with it, with a whole system in mind because you know you've got nlp there like it's a throwaway line nlp is is a huge technical language processing and setting that up to support reasoning is by itself a massive field. So my my advice is, um, this is also what Onto Commons is, is trying to do, but in a structured way by devolving parts of these to different groups um, and IOF as well. But but th there's no business value in this in the short term. I see. No, thanks, Melinda. Too long to deliver. I, I'll, I'll just clarify this. I never meant. Um, um, the businesses, there's no business value in how we see things. All I was saying is for us, um, from the perspective where we are at Cranfield, we've got an issue where we are constantly pushing. We have to give an answer even before we have a question. That That's the kind of nature we are in. So for us, it's unless until we can demonstrate that value, we struggle to go through. Now, part of this, a lot of these elements are working in advance. So, the NLP side of things, we are working for the last three odd years, maybe four years. Um, probably I worked before that with the terminology recognition. So I call it a taxonomy and building up that extraction of information. Uh, but if you look at the different levels of how we have looked at, say, AR, VR, or the digital tools, these things, we already have that level of expertise in. And for us, it's to add additional flavor to what we are already doing. That's where we are looking at different options. And we want to be the leading edge and work with the leading group. And that's why we are here, trying to interact, collaborate, seek knowledge. And, and I'll definitely take that point across. Um, I do agree there's a lot of things, but the size of our group is about 50 strong. We do different things. So it's not just me who's doing it. And I'm representing the, 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 just the group of people we are working with. And I'm not even going across our university to see what else people are doing. Well, and, and that's the real nature of it. Uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, not from an ontological point of view. Of course, any large organization, I mean, any business does all of these too, but they're not trying to stitch it all together in a semantically interoperable way. And that's the question we are trying to see if that and how we can promote that. Um, and probably. Or even if you should. Bits. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. We are trying to do it in bits. Uh, my job was to say how big our problem is. Um, probably there's a little bit of translation of how I said it. The but. other thing, can I just bear in can I just mention, and everybody should will probably also mention this, that for almost every item on that stuff, there are probably about 50 ISO or ANSI or other standards that prescribe how you should be doing that. So yeah. 
you know, don't forget the standards world is out there and standard world guides what happens in engineering. Very little, very little happens in in the design life cycle that is not governed by standards. We have a lot more flexibility in maintenance, but, you know, you can't go against the standards either. You have no, to make uh, I think it's a very good point. So currently we're working on um, an asset management standard as a guiding principle. Um, and we also do what we have released as of 2018, a publicly available specification on tool life engineering services. Um, so I am what do you mean you're working on an asset management standard? You're not using ISO 55001? We are, we are using ISO 55001, but okay. additionally, we are looking at the value co-creation uh, from the business imperative. So there is um, a publicly available stand, uh, specification called PASS 280, uh, which is into the through life engineering services where we are looking at the entire life cycle. And we are looking at the gaps. So currently we are discussing, we already have given uh, the perspective of how to look at technological development more so on the maintenance perspective. But we are now working with ATI on one end, Innovate on the other, with a regular group of uh, people, aerospace, uh, which is Airbus, Rolls Royce, uh, BAE Systems, uh, Bombardier, um, MOD. And we are trying to come up with uh, how the true life aspect of the uh, coming up. But that's a slightly different discussion. I haven't touched base on it because that's uh, another group of work uh, which we are trying to align to. So there is a mapping of this onto our. Uh, theme of through life engineering services uh, and that's probably why there's a bit of a split and and it looks like a humongous activity but we actually do a lot of this uh, internally so perhaps this is a pretty I, I don't want to take up that we, we probably taking that. That. oh okay I, I didn't know how we were doing our time so I was like being very careful uh, yeah, how I go through it um, my question is very simple, but I mean, you already uh, say many things. I mean, you mentioned that anyway, you're already dealing or having knowledge graph that you, know, you set up, right? But what do you think is the advantage of bringing a more, let's say, ontology thinking or ontology formal representation instead of other types of knowledge graph? So, um, we are working with uh, R2 Data Labs, which are run by uh, Rolls Royce. Uh, what we're trying to create is a repository for the aerospace group uh, and we are specking out the different elements of digitalization and one of the aspects which people uh, are very interested in is the knowledge base uh, and the simplistic question is that human in the loop if you ask me if you give me a data set i'll look at the metadata i'll look at the numbers where it came from what data i need to extract what image i need to and present it in a representative format based on my experience over the years and how I've seen it. So if I do a thermal inspection and I know that it's going to be in thermal data, I can put a, a some form of a, a polynomial fitting, I can extract that information on a time by time, frame by frame basis. Uh, and, and that's me as an expert looking at, oh, there is this strong variation, there's a change in the trend line. So that, what does that correspond to? So on and so forth, that goes back to the characterization. Uh, the challenge we've got is, yes, we already know all of that. Yes, that's brilliant. But can we make it more intuitive, more available, more shareable? How do we then extend it across our network? How do we uh, provide that as a uniform source? So there is an initiative from the Auto Data Labs where they're working with a variety of industries and any public data set where they want to capture that information, extract it automatically. Uh, the database is huge. Um, so if you just Google an R2 data labs, you'll see. And they're also working with the NASA, uh, the data hub as well, where they are trying to get the influences. Now to answer your question where the knowledge gap was, there is a few different things. You've seen an example where we supported uh, the uh, R2 data labs, um, but we are still learning. I, I, I'm, I'm really, really struggling to say, this is the right way forward. Uh, we are not in a position to make that decision. So currently we are investigating across what is available around the world, how we can uh, influence it. So uh, from the ontological perspective, my journey is about learning how best to do it. Is that a good approach? How can I relate it back? Will that solve the problems I have got? Because if I go to my software guy, he'll say, oh, come on, this is painful. Why should I, it's, it's, it's a lot of coding and I've got to do this. Uh, where you can actually extract knowledge. So we went back and looking at the web inter interface and how the different databases have been integrating and we see that value. And that's what we want to translate to. But 
How practical is it? I don't know. All right, thanks. Francesco? Anyone? Oh, you're, the, you're next. So, So, uh, if everything is in order, my, I am Francesco Compagno of the Laboratory for Applied Ontology of the Italian Institute uh, National Research Council. And today I'm going to present you very briefly the ninth demonstrator in the Homos project in its use case. So it'll be a very brief 10 minutes presentation and basically I will just flesh you with some uh, comments, with some remarks about our research. So uh, BLM Group is a corporate group of enterprises that manufactures tube bending and tube cutting machines. In particular, Abige, uh, it's one of the biggest company of these groups, and uh, it focuses on uh, manufacturing uh, laser cutting. <clears throat> Example, this picture, as you can see, it's uh, the head of one of such machines. Basically, the head moves, and um, from this nozzle, the laser beam goes out and it uh, hits the metal tube and it basically vaporizes the metal in such a way that there is a clean cut, and of course the laser head basically dances around the tube, drawing complex geometry. And now this picture shows the full machine, there are many kinds of these machines, and the laser cutting proper happens around the metal in an enclosed special chamber. Now, uh, I would have shown you a video of the cutting action, but I don't trust the network uh, to, to be able to do so. so if, you, if you go, if you search the internet, you go to the website at www.blmgroup.com, then you can uh, have a look and see also the videos. So basically, <coughs> the company uh, at the moment has some, let's say, issues with uh, uh, knowledge management strategy, in particular from the maintenance point of view, since we are working with the service department of the company. So, for instance, there it is, uh, say it's unclear which data and how should be recorded exactly, say, during a maintenance intervention, uh, during maintenance field intervention, then the technicians repair uh, stats, and then sometimes it writes down a report. Uh, what should we take from that record and so on? And then uh, it's unclear, I mean. And also, sometimes uh, information about previous encountered problems, as well as more in general about general machine characteristics, is difficult to search. So sometimes, I say, the same problem arises uh, many times, and every time, like uh, it is uh, solved from scratch. And in general, the current way of doing things is basically it's, it feels cumbersome. It feels like too much work for too little gain. Say, for instance, the data quality is generally low, so you cannot really trust uh, uh, the data and so on. So you, you will not use it at its full potential. And also other stuff, but you get the idea. So for these reasons, uh, the company has decided to participate in the Onto Commons project uh, with uh, uh, the role of demonstrator. 
and it is collaborating with the laboratory for applied technologies in order to uh, participate in the project. Of course, its goal is to realize an ontology based system, uh, sorry, a maintenance, an ontology based maintenance system that should hopefully solve or at least manage the previous problems. Now, uh, at the moment, our research is um, focused on the mainly on these three goals. So, as a precondition, we would like to find ontologically sound ways in order to model uh, engineering systems. And of course, we would like to build an ontology uh, such that it encompasses the uh, vocabulary of technical terms that are currently used by engineers and technicians. And of course, then this ontology, this vocabulary should become part of an application pipeline that uh, should merge uh, with the company's workflows and should facilitate the technician's work. Now, there are some notable remarks from uh, our research. So the first thing that we notice is uh, that uh, engineers and technicians, basically they, in their uh, daily activities, they use uh, very, very complex kind of entities, very so from an ontological point of view, they are puzzling for the functions, systems, parts, failure modes, road causes, and so on and so forth. So basically, for each one of these topics, of these concepts, uh, you can find a, a rich literature, both in engineering and in applied ontology, that mitigates uh, studies them, uh, suggests methodologies in order to model them, and so on and so forth. So basically, for this reason, as well as the fact that the current methodologies are well, they do work, they are very effective sometimes, but still there are generally there are many unsolved problems. So they are not the best that they could be. And of course, we are here since we believe that an applied ontology approach, applied ontology techniques could better some aspects of these methodologies. So now I, I will just discuss briefly some examples. So for instance, I say we have um, field technicians that uh, repair machines and then they write down uh, some records. So, uh, and so uh, of course, they, these records are, have contained plenty of useful information, but the question is how are you going to extract this information? But because the first thing that you can do is just, well, just write them down and copy them into the enterprise management system, and then perhaps you will search them using. Uh, full text search, something like that, but this doesn't really work. So uh, the next step would be obviously say, uh, one possible step would be say, I don't know, we associate tags to each uh, uh, record and uh, and then uh, these tags, uh, we use them to search. So basically you classify the records in categories. So basically you build a taxonomy of uh, malfunctions. And then the, the, the company already did try something like this, but it turns out it's extremely complex, actually. Uh, it's not clear how you should do it. Uh, it's not clear what the general principle behind that you should follow in order to do this. And it's basically, it is an ontological problem. Now, there is, there are uh, many other problems that uh, of ontological nature, say, we like to out of the characterization, of course, you could you say during root cause analysis and so on. Of course, we would like to explain the, the meaning of give some analysis of the complex terms used by the technicians, uh, and then there are some other problems. And so on. But, um, and of course, our goal as a researcher is to um, attempt to answer this question to bring about ontology that is sound. Modern for maintenance related. But just uh, and as a last example, so I take the, the last point in this list. So, one, we have one requirement and many others, but this requirement we take now as an example. Uh, we should build the, the ontology uh, in such a way that the resulting application feels as natural as possible for the clinicians because if they if it is weird for them, they are not going to use it. So we have this requirement. And the question is, how do you implement this requirement? So suppose that uh, we, we study the texts or the experts' uh, speech and so on and so forth, uh, and say they say something like this. 
or you find it written down, the right, the right tail light from the car was replaced with black. Okay, this example is fake, but I promise you that the real example will look like this. Uh, and the question is, say, okay, we, we, we can say extract terms from this sentence, say there is a tail light, and there is left, right, tail light, and it is of the car, and it's part of the car. But the question is, uh, does it mean that there are things that are replaced twice, or uh, does it mean that uh, there are just two right headlights that was replaced during time? I mean, this is a modeling question. I mean, if you answer this question, you can answer it in many different ways. It's an ontological question. And uh, depending on how you answer this question, uh, the model that you will produce will be um, extremely different uh, depending on your answer. And, this is not answer. I mean, you, you can accept terms from a, a corpus of, of uh, text, and, but uh, you can do uh, carry out on those analysis to answer this question. Uh, analogous problem to so say uh, you read a uh, manual the company, and there is a sentence like this, say the device, I wouldn't be able to translate in English, sorry. But, yeah, sorry uh, there is a thing that allows another thing to lift the bar. Okay, and now the question is, okay, so maybe there is a bar, which is, I don't know, a noun, it's an object, I don't know, there are the devices, okay, other physical objects, and lifting, or perhaps it's a function, I don't know, and then there is allows, <laughs> and the question is, okay. so should the uh, allow, to allow, allows, be a term of our vocabulary, should we analyze it, should it become a concept in our ontology, and if so, is it a function, a relation, relation among function? A relation among a device and a function, okay, well, should we just ignore it? Well, I know, of course, this is another ontological question. And so, basically, um, I just wanted to say that uh, <coughs> the question is uh, uh, that uh, you can, uh, you, you have to carry out ontological analysis in order to uh, answer this question. Uh, and we believe that if you do so, if you carry out this ontology analysis well, then you will uh, build a high quality ontology that hopefully will integrate in the company's workflow in a satisfactory way, which is basically uh, our main research for the moment. But that's it. So, this is the last slide, and if you have questions, I will be here to answer them. Good, thanks. Time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, yes, thank you for the presentation and also the, the use of LaTeX uh, for your presentation. I think it's a good step to, for digital transition to use such tools. And, uh, but uh, there's a very small question about the context of the plant. What language do speak the, the people in the plant? So, sorry, could you add? Which language speak the people in the plant? Do you mean like Italian, English, Spanish? Or any dialect or German, or you know? Yeah, and the, uh, the, the company is based in Italy mostly, or mm -hmm. so, uh, the main, uh, yeah, the, okay, mostly Italian, but also a little bit of English, German, Spanish, basically, but mm -hmm. mostly Italian and English. So, so. But the, the problem is like uh, most texts are uh, written in not really Italian, I should say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a technical, uh, technical, I mean, technical. Uh, not really technical language. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, we'll just, not, just go one thing then. How much have you looked into linguistics? But the certain questions you've said is about uh, stuff because I've looked at the same issue. How that uh, for the knowledge of structures and things, not not the ontological perspective, of course. Um, where we wanted to look at the relationship between terms. So we do use a lot of word models and so on and so forth. Because one of the things you said is like the right headlight is replaced twice. For me, it's the right headlight is one because the headlight is not lights, which means there's a, it's something which I would, as an expert, try to put that into training. So it's all about that linguistics approach. Have you looked at um, that? aspect of uh, how to combine because there are not fully developed but some most general english uh, pickup should actually work 
I don't know. Sorry, I think I didn't get the question. Sorry, have you looked at linguistics for your um, extraction? Well, aspect? no, we don't. I mean, if we have, if I have studied linguistic, I would say no, or just, but again, no, I, I, I didn't uh, say any study linguistic terminological databases for, with the possible exception, say, of uh, this. Uh, no, yeah, just me. But sorry, uh, so maybe I'm not able to answer your question, but I would say so. In this case, basically, you could take uh, the, the literal meaning of the sentence, say, so as you say, there is only one headlight, but uh, uh, also, or otherwise, we could uh, say, say, no, no, this is just a linguistic construct that it has no relation with reality. But then the idea is no, no, okay, we, we try to understand what experts mean when they say this, and if they consistently have it in their mind, and then they will write it down, but if they have a concept of a right headlight that survival place. And if so, in the model, there will be an object that can be replaced many times. So, and um, but uh, uh, the, 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 this is not uh, a study uh, carried out from a linguistic point of view. We, we can use, uh, among other bases, uh, linguistics are other bases. But then the question is is the uh, apparent uh, syntactical structure of the uh, sentence uh, a, a true representation of reality of the uh, subject matter expert mind, or it is just a smoke and mirrors? For the exception of, I don't know, terms extraction, we didn't use it. All right, thank you. So the last presentation before the panel session is Alessia. Good morning and thank you for inviting me here. So I guess I am the most uh, outsider of this of this conference here today. And uh, I am Alessia Pitareta, I'm the oil car and I in an industrial company in Fidia, based in Italy, who produces machine tools uh, for manufacturing. Uh, and I also represent the project CDMP, which you see here. It's another European founded project. It's a very large one. In this project, I do coordinate uh, all the industrial partners uh, in the entirety of the use cases. So maybe I can show you a bit also of uh, other sector rather than just mine. So, well, the title of the, con of the, the session today was the role of ontologies in industrial environment. Uh, so I thought, well, let's start at the beginning with the industrial environment, uh, which is what I know. The ontology, I really don't know. So <laughs> let, let's find a way to, to meet each other halfway. This is the type of machinery we make. So it's a very large uh, equipment for manufacturing, for high-speed milling. Uh, this is used um, for high-quality, high-precision manufacturing. So this machine will end up in aerospace and mode production, basically. So where the value of the piece you produce is uh, high enough to justify this kind of expense. Um, we do also produce our own CNC, uh, which gives us a, a, a peculiar situation in which we are completely proprietary, both of all the data coming from the sensor, the entire access of the PLC, which is proprietary language as well, or if not standard, uh, to the machine, up to, to the mechanics itself. So we do cover all the line. And this is the reason why we are so interested in data right now, because we are having this transition and we have this nice position of having really the access to all of it. 
So given the title of this presentation and given uh, that I always saw the ontology word coupled with the models, it was always models and ontology for industry or for manufacturing. And I realized I didn't really understand the word. So I said, well, let's try and ask my colleagues. And then the first uh, answer I got was a blank face, uh, just not knowing what we were talking about. And these are just some of the funniest answers uh, I got, uh, and I, I hope you will laugh a little bit about this. So they told me, is it a book? Is it dentist related animals? And at first I was not understanding what they were talking about, but of course they would just forget talking about anthologies uh, and or orthodonty instead of ontologies. And <laughs> ornithology, I really got that answer from one of my colleagues. Uh, and well, mythology, just for the mythology part. In Italian, it does sound similar, so this is the actual translation of it. And of course, I got all other kinds of I don't remember and blank faces. Um, and then we got someone that got a bit closer in my idea. You can, of course, disrupt uh, this uh, closeness uh, <laughs> idea that I have, but at least uh, some of them um, got a bit closer on the fact that maybe a set of rules and something that is really helping us um, in describing the reality of Shizu. Um, this was kind of a joke, but just to, um, to let you understand that for the industrial world, it's quite difficult to understand what we are talking about sometimes. And these are questions that have been done to all levels of my company. So from uh, the software developers uh, to um, the technological assistants uh, to the actual workers that uh, operate the machines, because uh, I have them in my building. So luckily, in, uh, in companies like mine, we have a strong R&D department, but also when we don't know something, we have collaborative research, which is really a nice way to, to learn and try something we never tried before. So um, the, the project I'm representing today is the uh, ZDMP. In ZDMP, we are trying to make a zero defect manufacturing platforms, which means uh, to have a set of tools uh, like building blocks uh, that are useful to build uh, zero defect uh, applications. This is what uh, the, the most of the project is trying to do, and I'm representing use cases in that. So as you can imagine, there are many, many different aspects of building these building blocks. Of course, there is the, the software application part. Uh, we need some input from the manufacturing infrastructure, and we need the, the entire system to have a structure and work by itself. It's not, not just implementing the specific functions we need in the, um, in the specific type of industry. Uh, but also we needed the interoperability for these zero defect solutions to be, or building blocks, to be useful in constructions as well as in machine tools, as well as in automotive, because at the end, sometimes the necessities are the same. So we had to plan carefully which necessities were the same. For example, to give you an idea, um, a visual monitoring of a part might be very similar for different uh, type of machines or a different, different type of application. You will always have a camera, you will always need to connect it, you will always need to transfer data. And no matter if it is data coming from an electronic device or from um, an automotive uh, application. So I just wanted to give you an overview of how big is this project. Uh, we are about 30 um, partners and companies, uh, 14 of which uh, are in industries. Uh, we are representing two very large supply chains uh, that goes from electronics to automotive, and uh, we, we call it provision, but it is a construction um, field. And uh, we do develop a lot of uh, small applications, thank you to these building blocks, uh, that should help us transfer data and knowledge, especially quality-related knowledge, along the supply, the supply chain. So, well, of course, the, the, the one I know better is my field, the machine tool field. Um, we do have a provider, HSD, which is a provider of uh, um, highly valuable equipment, in this case, the spindle, uh, which is an important piece by itself uh, to be mounted in the machine. We have the machine producer, which is us, and a user of our machine. Uh, the interest we have in this type of analysis is that uh, this is a, is a supply chain, a real-life supply chain, 
And as it is at the moment, we don't exchange data along it. We just exchange data one-to-one, -one, especially related to the quality of the part we produce. We give it distinct about uh, how well it performs, uh, but not related for this, from the single part of the supplier up to the end of the chain, just uh, as tested by us. So I just wanted to show we have uh, an actual example of one of these applications being uh, shown. This is an improvement of, of a digital twin um that we do have a distribution video um we realize that we have uh, this is a view of uh, our of our tool and how it works and um, in the project we are, we are enhancing some of the capabilities uh, of this uh, always thanks to these uh, building blocks so we are well ahead uh, with the developments at this stage um, i don't think we need to show too much about we are going through. But what I think it's interesting is to see that for each of the data application, which are related to a natural need in the company, we did map it uh, uh, with all the technologies that were needed uh, and that uh, these technologies or building blocks are used based on the, what are the needs uh, of the specific application. And so what are the needs? So that, that's the important part for us. Uh, so first of all, digital data and connectivity. I said it in the beginning, it's an industrial interest for FIDIA, but it's also an industrial inter interest right now with all the 4.0 transition for everyone. Um, we do have a problem with that. We realize uh, we um, are inventing it uh, all by ourselves. So each time we make an, a new application, we just reinvent how to gather data, how to classify it, uh, how to, how to, to make, uh, make a database. Uh, with some uh, prescription like not occupying the entire space of the CNC with just a normal computer and cannot store too much, how often to cancel it, etc. And how to classify it. Then uh, how to monitor different assets. This is very important because our customers will not have just our machine. They will have tons of machines. They will need to use them all. And possibly they will need to monitor them all in a similar, at least, way. So if we all just make our tools the way we want, uh, it doesn't work for them to interface them uh, and to monitor them all together. And then, of course, we need the interoperability in the sense that if we change something, it still needs to work so with what we have changed and uh, the, the, the compatibility as well. What that means. So, I guess the question for you uh, I would have loved to be able to answer how the ontology can help us in these challenges. And I've seen that many, many of on, on the previous presentation, many answers have, uh, have picked up that might actually be um, useful. Uh, these are just a few of my thoughts on the, on the topic. So I, I think at some point uh, we will need in the industry as, as well a formalization of knowledge uh, in a way that is uh, common to all of the developers. Uh, although this is very difficult because uh, the, the companies in the machinery uh, are competitors, so they will not agree on one standard to be the same for everyone. So if we if we manage to reach something that is uh, you know uh, indivisible uh, and it, it's sensible for everyone to reach, probably we can go in that direction. Also, catalogs not to re-implement what already exists because this is uh, most of our effort right now is going in that direction. Uh, and then, of course, also sets of rules that are common for the digital data and connectivity. If it's possible, um, I think some of, uh, of the people before already talked about that practical implementation of ontology. I, I don't know if, if, uh, if this goes in the direction of the building blocks, but uh, from uh, an industrial perspective, we would really love to be able to use things in, a, in an easy way. So if some standard exists, we will also love there to be a way for us to implement it in an easy to, to access way. So I think that's mostly what I had for you today. It's not a question, it's a, more like a comment. Mm -hmm. You said that you didn't give an answer, but I believe you gave one of the most useful answers that the, uh, there is a need 
bridging ontology work with industrial work. So there must be, there should be a more industry friendly way of uh, using ontologies in industrial environment. So I think you gave a very good answer. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry, I have to take the place of the Afternoon, everyone. I think we've had a very interesting set of discussions this morning. I think some of those questions we brought to the panel, um, I think some of them in part answers what we wanted to go through. Uh, but I think let's introduce the panel uh, for this um, session. Uh, we're running a little bit late, but I think we should be able to cover a fair bit of ground, I think. Um, so uh, we've got on panel, um, so my name is Pavan, again, you've met me, I'm the host for this session. Um, I've got, so we've got Melinda remotely joining us and we've got Marcus stepping in for her. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we've got Hedy, um, Stefano couldn't join us, so he's represented by Francesca. Um, of course, we've got Lewis, and you're not standing in, are you? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got Emilia as well. So, so I think one of the um, aspects uh, we wanted to look at today is on the maintenance perspective. And one of the aspects is uh, how do we do the journey uh, of maintenance um, through the ontology world. Um, certainly we've got a mix of uh, practitioners uh, where they want to come along and they've got the experts on the other end who actually looked at it in a little bit more detail uh, where Melinda presented early on a uh, little bit on the different categories of the ontology, the maintenance perspective. Um, I think the first one question which I wanted to ask was, um, as a group, where do you think is the maturity levels are? How do we get there as a group? How do we provide the guidance to the, the rest of us? Uh, because otherwise everybody's going to go and say, hey, I've created an ontology. Uh, I can tell you from my perspective, I created a taxonomy. That's the level I can say. Uh, but I think there's that demarcation where people think creating that is an ontology. So let's get some views from your perspective. 
Okay, so let me start. So, uh, so I'm an IT guy. So this is my background. And I did my PhD on ontology for maintenance. And the first thing that when I started that was from my background, any OWL file is an ontology. Okay. And before that, because when I started my PhD, there, there is not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a wide use of uh, our language. So most of what exists as ontologies are UML class diagram. So I started my PhD like this from an IT guy background, and I started to, to develop uh, a UML class diagram. And uh, one of the projects that Dimitris mentioned this morning, uh, also a PROMISE project, PLM, also they developed what they call the, <clears throat> I think, object semantic uh, model uh, for PLM integrating maintenance, and it was also a UMI class diagram. So uh, this is how we started. And then the question is, what is the degree of maturity? So what is maturity in, in term of, 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 of ontology and maintenance? Uh, so, um, what, what was amazing from my case, because I, I worked with domain experts. So it was amazing because I, I was discovering maintenance. And it was also amazing because it trained me to not think only from IT perspective, but from domain perspective. And I think there is a lot of work on maintenance ontology that exists in the, the state of the art, uh, which are built independently from the domain expert. They are provided by some IT guys like me at the beginning, and the focus was from the beginning, IT, CMMS, mm -hmm. software, mm -hmm. and such kind of things. So the then after that, I mean, you start, I started to, to think from top level point of view and, and with Melinda, we worked on the state of the art, what exists and try to, to have a multi perspective of, of maintenance and, and, and started with, with the Romanian ontology and, and, and the idea is really to, to, to go uh, uh, further on, on this direction uh, in order to push the use of, of let's say formal ontologies, and also to have like a methodology for all maintenance ontologies uh, in the future. So in the under the umbrella of, of, of IUF, and also uh, let's say to have a, a hierarchy or a network of maintenance ontology modules that can be interoperable and that cover the different perspectives in the domain. But this is my I can see that vigilant. Yeah. Certainly, see. So can we can we invite uh, somebody else to uh, add or maybe uh, try to give a different perspective? Um, I guess I'll provide a delta to that. And so, I as I said before in this workshop, um, I try to abstract from the language specifics when I talk about ontologies. Uh, the key aspect is the formal nature of it, right? Once you have a formal definition, uh, as long as you maintain the semantics, it does not matter how you show it. You can adjust it to whatever is necessary to communicate with the domain. Right? Um, but so the formal definition is important, but also the ability to show that you can do something useful with it. Right? And so I think in, in that sense, the, the maturity in particular within IRAC is relatively high because we did start from completely specifically. Uh, based on, on the data that were available and the work that Melinda has done, we have shown that it can be used effectively for real particular tasks. Right? And I think that's uh, a very good thing to have, particularly because from the IT perspective, when you look at the engineering cycle, you know, maintenance tends to get a bit the second chair. You know? And so having an early go as a uh, working of ontology within my life happened for you. Right. Uh, I think I, I certainly relate to where you're saying, and perhaps that's one of the aspects of how we see maturity. Um, 
one of the other aspects, again, in tandem with the maturity levels, um, perhaps is it a work giving us a vision on um, how we as a community can control this and, and, and probably even look at the future adaptability? Because remember, things are evolving, technologies are evolving, so our mindset is changing. Ten years ago, if you ask me what is data, I would say like, oh, it's a spreadsheet, pretty picture. Now, for me, even talking, this is data. Okay. So again, along the maturity lines, how do we, as a community, be vigilant and, and offer that guidance? Um, because currently, I see that as a chaos theory, and we need to come to some level of calmness that people can harmonize. Because there was a discussion about harmonizing these uh, ontologies uh, from different perspectives. Uh, what would your uh, any guidance factor anybody wants to say? Yeah, please. Um, yes, concerning the question of maturity, uh, maturity is about uh, already the news of the matters of the industry. I thought that was a very interesting role. Uh, I think uh, there is a lack of maturity for understanding the news today in the industry. And also in uh, some uh, research project, uh, for uh, uh, H2020 European program, for instance, uh, by the way, it's, uh, there's a 4C cluster right, for the, uh, uh, the white paper on predictive methods. And maybe you can see maybe four times the terminology in the hundred pages. Just that I've mentioned, but uh, they are being explored from something the project I was involved in uh, in the hot time. But uh, IT people uh, were very reluctant to use ontology because they were using some existing components we were trying to improve according to the weekly opinion and the team. And uh, they said yes, but uh, the building ontology is a very long process. And uh, so we, we are looking in the framework of the, of the project to be honest to, uh, to take that, 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 that direction. That was the main uh, obstacle to from from my point of view. Considering the the what I would say the Marcos about the formal ontology, uh, so, so some people uh, jump to 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 a tool to begin to to make an ontology. Uh, so it's more like computational ontology before there is a formal ontology, but before there is also uh, a kind of uh, uh, financial ontology, how people make see what is common and what is different between different types of management uh, and uh, to build the structure and after maybe formal. But so the first step is maybe teachers also a request from, from the people, from the practitioners, who have the same vocabulary mm -hmm. first. And so, to maybe a good way to, uh, to, to have a redefinition is to take advantage of existing standards, uh, defining vocabulary, methods, and it's even there we, we also uh, maybe have published it on a GitHub for different definitions, maybe uh, it was about more than 500 terms, but already uh, maybe 80 or 70 terms are these definitions from different standards, EM standards, ISO standards. Uh, IEC standards as well. And so, maybe it's the first, the first step, taking advantage of uh, an existing uh, uh, shared knowledge because <laughs> it's a long process also to make a standard with a uh, richer consensus between, between experts. Huh? Huh? And so, uh, okay. And uh, but the last point, maybe, is also that, uh, for instance, also in the Latin community, People from reliability or IMT uh, methods have not the, exactly the same language. So I think uh, it's important to, 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 to deepen this, uh, this approach of small ontological reviews. But uh, maybe the question is to which extent of that we, we, we make this small, uh, mm. small chunks of. Uh, if I can add a comment, yes. I mean, of course, ontology engineering is a recent discipline in comparison to other efforts in the scientific community, right? So we have a lot of challenges from a theoretical point of view and also from a technical point of view. 
that we still uh, had to deal with. Like evaluating an ontology is really hard. There is not like a stable methodology to make an evaluation. And also concerning the modularization, it's not at all easy how you modularize an ontology in a robust manner. But I think that bridging, let's say, as people were saying before, uh, ontology with the industrial world, I mean, my answer to this is really simple, is that uh, you guys have to hire ontologists. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, no, this is uh, this is really serious. I'm really serious on that. I mean, in the sense that uh, developing an ontology is an engineering discipline. So Barry Smith said always, uh, if you, you want to develop an ontology, you should not do that. You should hire someone who is able to develop the ontology for you. I mean, if you want to bridge your apartment, you don't do that by yourself. If you want to, if you want to come to Tarp by plane, you know, you just you do not just try to fly. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, ontology engineering is very hard, and developing an ontology does not mean to use necessarily a semantic web approach. I mean, mm -hmm. ontology engineering is not semantic web modeling necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. But this is something that I think that we have to uh, yeah. be aware of it, and and one should recognize the role of ontologists as a, as an important role nowadays in data science and computer and computer science. I mean, this is let, let me join Emilio on that point because um, I receive a lot of calls from people from industry. Do you know someone to hire? There is a problem of training. Yeah, there is a problem. So there is a pro the profile of ontology is, is is missing on the market. And uh, what we want is ontologists, but also ontologists with some engineering background. So this is one of the rules that you try to, to develop with an ontocommons with what we call the knowledge management translators. At the beginning, we call it ontology translator. But then when discussing with industrials in order to be more accessible, so we call it this role of uh, knowledge manager, management translator to, to, to play this role of ontology that has link or strong link with IT guys uh, and IT background and domain expertise. Even though if I, mean, I can just add a short comment on this, I mean, we should also think, recognize that ontology engineering is an interdisciplinary effort. So because, I mean, ontology engineering is thinking ontologically and having formal and conceptual means to develop ontology. And if we train people to be so general and so abstract, then any domain, I mean, can be. It's just then a matter of reading, you know, a mechanical specification, being able to translate it in a neurological relationship, right? But I mean, you can train an ontologist for doing bioinformatics, mechanical engineering, digital humanities. I mean, this is, I think, this is the wonderful thing of ontology engineering, right? That we develop abstract systems, abstract methods, which we can then can deliver to the most specific people. Yes. From an industry perspective, what you are saying is uh, very important. And this uh, is uh, a previous presentation because ontology is not a matter of philosophy or we don't need uh, to associate this to a doctor or a copist or a specialist. From an industry perspective, it's effective. And this implies to type correctly, in fact, uh, the individuals have no information system to reference uh, classic, a minimum of subject matter external knowledge of the It's not it doesn't work. You are lucky if you start your phone training or training. It's the beginning. But at the moment they will realize we have all to run. So it's a uh, transition, and I believe that is one of the key of this digital transition. The smoothest task we can provide. You, can, you should offer these salaries, and then we find people. It's not only a matter of salary because there are uh, resistance of the organization about the
of the menu. And in the uh, is implied to have a common way to structure the information and transform it common. The yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, perfect. Okay. Sorry, I, I was just trying to find out uh, if there's if you got that point across. Uh, people are joining virtually. Make sure. Um, Can you hear us, Melinda? Can you hear us? I, I'm back again. Yes, now I just wanted to let you know that on LinkedIn, in the whole world, there are 871 ontologists. 800. It's a good search. Good search. So I, I think I'm, I think I'm going to touch base and trying to extend the conversation. So I think one of the things like where Alicia spoke about what is an ontology from the industry perspective, uh, don't get me wrong, I've got a lot of people who don't uh, certainly understand what ontology includes myself as well. And I still say myself as a learner. The, I think one of the biggest issues because of the science perspective, we understand the level of validation becoming a new touch base on it. Uh, uh, earlier, earlier um, because it is a very hard uh, aspect to uh, accomplish something that is so philosophically strong uh, and, and making sure that it actually fits for purpose, if, if I may use the term. Perhaps that's not the term you'd like to hear, uh, but it's coming from the, the lowermost uh, uh, on the floor, real time, trying to work with machines, trying to get this uh, things offered. How would you say um, there could be improvements in the current validation going forward? Um, is there an effort collectively to try and streamline it into uh, a value-driven proposition, which is more clear so people embrace? And, and, and that goes back to that hiring, training uh, ontologist, because where is there uh, a formality? And if only 800 people are there across the world who claim themselves as ontologists. If we are trying to go in through this digital aspect and the number of people who say this to twin, probably we are going to struggle if that's where one of the applications is going to be. Would you want to comment on that? How do we improve that as a community to go out and say, you know what, you know, we've got a good level of guidance and this is how you should validate. Melinda, do you want to say anything on this? Yeah, I'm not wild about the question, actually. Sorry. Uh, you know, it, it's um, when we talk about validation, I think you're I think you're in danger of putting us into the same sort of box as doing some sort of machine learning thing where you want some sort of confusion matrix, simple solution. But the the ability to address competency questions that the industry user has in an adequate way, remembering that the interpretation of textual data by industry is not perfect ever, what are you validating against? So I think the biggest problem with ontologies is you do not have a golden standard to validate against. So you're comparing the reasoning from a human with the reasoning of a machine. The reasoning from the human is imperfect at best and wrong at worst. In many ways, the ontology offers a more consistent and standardized view of the way in which the reasoning was done than a set of humans ever will. So I, 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 I struggle with the question. That's actually a very good answer. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And that's something which I want everybody to hear it out loud. I, I don't want to go out and uh, be telling people, oh, this is what we should do, something is there. And I think one of our colleagues, they said, it's disruptive. So probably there is a, a real need uh, to grow uh, to um, a state. Any comments, any additional comments? Does anybody want to add anything yes. on that? Yes. This please. is good, but the news has no way to manage or to get from machine 
on the on the tables and stuff, you know, whatever. So there is a primary element. There are no tables to manage properly the label uh, across the company on the domain. There's no way for uh, AI for a proper email or uh, IoT. It's really not. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to add a little bit of data on this. So basically, uh, one thing that I would like to see more uh, in the Jewish community that I think we have to validate ontologies is uh, basically, um, of course, we need use cases. And uh, of course, uh, but th th this is clear, for instance, Melinda uh, already commented upon that topic. But then when, with these use cases, of course, we will try to use application ontology and argue that, yes, see, with this application ontology, you can build the application and it's a good application. And so but then uh, another thing I would like to see, so basically, when, uh, when you build an application ontology, an application build, you will have to, uh, to make decisions, you will have to make choices. So basically, you, you will have to commit to some point of view about the world because we know there is a, a, a galaxy of ontologies. Indeed, the Onto Common project uh, is made of objective is indeed to bring about an ecosystem of these ontologies, and you know, we cannot simply kill every ontology, etc. So now, every time you choose one ontology with respect to other ontology, you make a choice, you make an ontological commitment. And I think uh, many times uh, um, th there will always be a link, a consequence of uh, many consequences of this commitment uh, on the level of the use case, on the level of application ontology. But it, I, I, this seldom ex explicitly stated and described. So I think this is one thing that we have tried, we have attempted to in our work. So basically, they say that okay, if you if you commit to this and you you make this choice, then it will have these effects. Of course, there will be effect on the ontological level, on the domain level, on the application level, and then the, indeed on the user application, and the, the, the user experience. So I would like to see a mapping between the uh, ontological commitments, even high level abstract ontological commitments, uh, over the the even the user. Uh, experiences. So we, then we can argue that, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe for you, that uh, you are a user, the ontology is a black box uh, that is built upon other black boxes and yeah, so, but, but you can uh, you can get this experience uh, if uh, you use that black box and that, that other black box will you give this other experience. So you will be able to understand some. Yes, so yes, yes, I will come back to, to this idea of formal validation, but in the, maybe in ontology, but of design in, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if uh, formal validation is sufficient. If you are a user of recycle, for instance, of, uh, and, uh, you need also to, to have a, a, a real validation, an intuitive validation. Of, uh, and uh, maybe ontology can help to, uh, to compute things, but to provide uh, the industrial users, the designers, with an environment where they can test mm -hmm. uh, operational scenarios, which is the content, that's a new and form. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the point. And, uh, uh, some tools also uh, for my uh, formal uh, validation of the participants. Mm -hmm. yes, so, certainly, I'm a, yes. Yes. certainly, where I come from, validation means. Uh, guaranteeing the correctness in the domain of application. Yeah, this is also, I mean, some of the things because we, we, we have to be sure about the definition of validation mm -hmm. because there is difference between validation and verification. Yes. So validation, as Marco said, I mean, it's we can validate on an application, but for example, if you take an, 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 an ontology of maintenance, can we validate that it works for all use cases in maintenance in the same maybe applications in different companies? So, so verification, it means that it's verified that it works everywhere. We are not in this case. So the validation is case by, by case. And this is, should be understood. 
because it's very important. That 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 I think is the most key information in addition to what Melinda said. Because I think the rightful point here we are saying is we're not just looking at the competency questionnaire as a means of drawing the purpose and see if that is fit for purpose, which I go back to the original statement, and also having the support from different use cases and perhaps a validation. Because for me, uh, a standard means it is generic, it has to be adapted to your purpose. And that's where that validation comes in, not verification, sorry. Yeah. Can I do a comment? You, you have said uh, that ontology is an uh, engineering activity. And therefore, what is ontology? It is itself a product of engineering, so it has its own life cycle. It may have its quality management, which means purpose, so on, competency question, parameters, and so on. So maybe there is a, an auto-reference system yeah. Yeah. Uh, that uh, ontology is itself an object that, is, that has to be managed as, as such. And I think that was briefly touched as well, because uh, say, for example, the asset management, there are all the rules and where they came there. Uh, we saw earlier from the presentation as well, the maintenance ontology used those reference terms and they tried painfully to come back to a common ground in how we define those terms. And, and you are right, we need to follow those established. And I don't think they are not, that, that's my no. perspective. They are following those guidelines we already put around as an engineering principle. The problem that, I mean, I think Emilio made the comment yesterday about uh, I mean, in industry, we deal with engineering processes, and we have the, I mean, we are patient on this process, engineering process, yeah. but we are not accepting that ontology engineering take time. I mean, people are looking for ontology in two weeks. Yeah. So it's, uh, ontology is a product. So it should take the time to do that. So that goes back to that maturity levels as well. Yeah. So we had one more question. Uh, yes. I, I just want to take into the computer science point of view where um, we talk about maybe software validation or software verification, but we never be able to validate the software. We know that it's self for some purposes and it work in some context, but we are never fully saying that it will never take uh, because there is always side effects, new things that are coming and com compatibility issues. So my question was more to us, why can't we think about how people use validate software? So we have maybe unit tests to see how wrong or how good is our ontology. We may have what we call um, functional tests to see if it works maybe regression test to see if it fit with what we have previously and so on. So I believe that there is something that we can take from there and maybe it's not perfect and then we build upon that. Yes, please. I mean, concerning uh, the, the thing that you were saying, I mean, I'm not sure whether I got it properly, but I mean, I don't see the circularity in the sense that you have the discipline and you have the methodologies. We have to take into account the life cycle, of course. And then the ontology is the product that undergoes, let's say, this development process, the maintenance, the evaluation, and so forth. I mean, there is a huge literature concerning ontology evaluation, and people have already adopted mm -hmm. this kind of thinking that you were mentioning. I mean, one important thing that Francesco was mentioning is that uh, there is a lot of work done in ontology design patterns, right? When you have, let's say, one problem, and then you develop different patterns in order to deal with this problem. And then the idea there is that you make an evaluation of the advantages and disadvantages. And then you select the one which better fits with your case. Like uh, Stefan Green was mentioning, if you have to model a date in a semantic web approach, like what do you do? You, you use like a string, so do you use a data property, or you need this date to make maybe temporal orders, and then you have to use maybe more of like another approach because otherwise you cannot model temporal relationships between between them. So you need like temporal regions and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, no, but this is what I'm mentioning. I mean, you, yeah, I mean, this.
this is what I'm saying, that you have these patterns for the same problem, and then you make an analysis and you pick up the one which is good for you. Also, in, in terms of methodology, I mean, most of ontology development methodology are inspired from software engineering. So, process in, in, yes, in the loop. I'm going to pick two aspects. Uh, we've got a follow on questions which some of the comments you made. Earlier. So, one aspect is um, what approaches and how do you recommend this to the industry perspective? to see how we can deal with this kind of a challenge. What would the guidance be in terms of saying, um, do we need to consider the application level sort of bottom to top, or the top to bottom that you've got? Because today, I, I think this yeah. workshop is all about talking about those um, formal ontologies and how uh, we take it into the industry and how we can be as gatekeepers and trying to give them the guidance. Um, I certainly think from my perspective, it's a mixture where it depends upon where you fit in. Again, going back to the fit to purpose kind of a platform, but it would be good to see your perspectives uh, across the panel to see how you see it, because um, uh, it, there needs to be a lot of uh, philosophical understanding and depth to go from the, uh, the approach where you're looking at the formal or top level ontology, so even uh, mid-level ontologies because uh, industries we are still at the practitioner level we are very relating to the application level ontology what would you the, what would be the best guidance uh, we can offer maybe if i can answer uh, maybe i can back just to, to this concept of ontologies as digital artifacts <coughs> produced like uh, engineered uh, systems mm -hmm. and ontology as uh, nicolas noir you say on the big for philosophy and the aesthetic uh, primary philosophy. I think uh, that most metaphysicians recognize that like, so their metaphysics fail. Right? And as rich is a mission and as much as fail. And so uh, I think in, in the industry uh, we have also an ontology. We have a philosophical ontology. And probably it's an ontology of system, but I, I will not uh, uh, develop that. But the ambition is it's, uh, it's not to, to, to explain everything. It's to just to, uh, to succeed in the production of the land or product satisfying the need and precise need and so on. So, uh, you need a top level, probably a top level ontology to clarify this concept, but they are not so easy in system, property, law, requirements, so things like that. And also, because we need also the bottom up approach, uh, because we have a uh, Different aspects. People have you know, all the same view on, on the structure of the object they are dealing with. There is a kind of standard size where we see it in the process uh, for uh, that is to identify the person for something like And there is a concept of a step function for the uh, location. And Maybe other, you can see other aspects. And also, the, we had the, some uh, mention this morning um, and insist on the fact that some prescribes the pursuit, for instance. So, for instance, we can have many discussions about what is the uh, We know you provide for an entire science of physics, etc. We know that we make an assumption that uh, this is a uh, continuum. But when we go into the world, we know it is not a continuum. But we make the assumption, and it's sufficient to, 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 to compute, uh, to compute that we know that we uh, 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 satisfy some, some, some needs. So, uh, but we are clearly useful to compare with it to. Other sectors like uh, insurance, uh, bank, a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge. Uh, and uh, so, uh, to capture all this knowledge, so yes, of course, it's a long way, but it would be helpful to have a strong conceptual framework based probably on systems based on technology to, uh, yes, to, 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 to put all 
of these different, uh, how many uh, these two assets, so sure. large, uh, smaller, so whatever, uh, and see how we can just improve it. So we make, I'm not saying, um, I know also what the description in the data lab or reset, and because there is that about all the existing models, all the knowledge equity. Melinda wants to say something about it. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, and yeah. you want to say yeah, sorry, I just, um, Eves, had you finished? I, I, it's a little difficult to hear, so I wasn't sure when I put my hand up. Um, I, I just wanted to make one comment as you talk a lot about, um, obviously, one of these really strong theoretical groundings, and, and you've got very strong theoreticians are up on the stage here and and to form these top level ontologies and these reference ontologies but you've got to remember that all of that is worth nothing if we can't deliver application ontologies that support decision making in the business so ultimately a valid ontology is somebody's using it to add value to a decision and if we can't do that we most will just pack up and go home from industrial ontologies I totally agree, and also I mean, from my perspective is so um, we should start by a bottom-up approach. But uh, how we deal with the top levels, from my side, is is it's a guidance to classify what we got from the, the, the bottom up. So and this is what we tried with Melinda. I mean, Romain yeah. Ontology. Sorry, sorry, I need to clarify. Sorry, I'm not suggesting there's totally a bottom-up approach. I, I think that's a waste of time also. If you don't take into account the top level and, and a good theoretical foundation, you end up making nonsense that can't be reusable, they're not modular, all of that. But ultimately, one has to connect the two. Yeah, but if you're right. not being used, you're not, you're not adding value if your work is not being used. Yeah, and this is the idea, to have a this hybrid approach, to guide yourself by the top level. And but don't, I mean, stay in your top level and don't stay in your bot, I mean, bottom level. So how to do this mix between that and how this top level can guide the bottom level. So this is the, the main idea. Very interesting in between with uh, now plus uh, bottom up, top bottom. Very often, some experience is done upon the coherence and both of us, but the separation is very valuable. I mean, there were also interesting experiences in Onto Commons and IUF, right, in the sense that you hide the bottom, sorry, you hide the top level to the users, to the final user, and you show like the middle layer. This is also something that, uh, in general, for domain experts, work, it works a little bit better because you talk about machines, you talk about tools, and then you know that at the upper level they depend on something else. But yes. You show them something which sits a little bit in the. Let's middle. say there is two phases. I mean, in in the ontology building uh, phase, you, you deal with the top level, but then when it comes to application and uh, uh, exploitation, you hide the spot for the end user. Okay. And this is, I think. Could be, I mean, one of the 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 ways in order to push adoption of ontology by by domain experts. I think that that gives a good idea, but I think yesterday from one of the sessions which I attended, one of the questions was, why did you pick this anthology to work with? From the industry perspective, um, even I have this thing. Okay, there's something available, I'll just use it. I know about it, I'm going to use it. But then we seldom forget the vision of where that's going to do. It, I'm talking about a software tools perspective, okay? so. What you're saying, and let me summarize this, is having a view of the top level ontology 
assuming that I'm having an ontologist to do this, going back to your earlier point, and trying to matriculate how we can build that application level. And perhaps when we come into uh, exploiting it or showing it to the others how it works, perhaps we shield the top level, only look at the uh, mid-level and probably the lower levels. Does that summarize uh, kind of a guidance and how we would like to see? In a way, I'm not saying that's the only approach. I'm just, mm -hmm. just trying to gather thoughts of what people have said and trying to summarize it, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've got the last question. I know uh, we are slightly over time. Yeah. Lunch is early, so. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a couple lunch. But I think the last question, which I wanted to touch base, um, where would you recommend, and this is slightly stemming from the discussions, we've said we need an ontologist, we need a domain expert, we need to consider how things are. How would you exploit this and show this as a, a value to a business proposition? It's slightly a complicated question because industry tends to think, yes, 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 I know. If you sit down and ask them, what is your problem? They even don't understand the problem. And if we go and say, hey, we've got something here, um, how do we do it? And, and you, you know, it was just said, I hate the term disruption, but industry loves the term disruption on the other perspective. Mm -hmm. So how, as a community, how do we look into making sure that the knowledge of transferring that ontologist perspective and the approaches working with the domain expert, how do we make sure that it becomes the through life aspect or the, the, the long life longevity of what we are trying to invest. Because remember, this is a collection of a lot of people, a lot of knowledge. And I think that is a high value asset and we need to make sure we make the best out of it. What would your recommendations be to look at that through life longevity? I know you touched base. So. We have to agree upon something like you. The software industry, uh, the value is to get a lot of money for the next quarter. <laughs> so, but in the uh, capital industry, like uh, nuclear power plants, and I think power is something we need, energy to, to have a uh, warm in the uh, uh, showers, uh, warm showers yeah. every day. Uh, it's uh, hundred years of, uh, of uh, energy to get. Okay. And all this software will not exist anymore. Uh, when uh, during this long uh, talk, of course, uh, for this kind of industry, there is another perspective. Mm. And, uh, and so uh, I think um, when we talk, we talk about formal ontology, top level ontology, we have to clarify if it is the same. For me, it's not the same. Formal ontology is more transverse to the domain. So we have a sensation for me. They say this button is a form of a scene. And after you can make some application, you can make this one. But so, the top level ontology is more or less to say this is a subclass of uh, something completely different. Uh, something you will call a subclass of a classification now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and uh, um, I think we. We have also to think about um, the place of the human being with different, with different, uh, different uh, horizons, different experience, different knowledge, uh -huh. different way of interpretation, the same, the same result of a computation, for instance. And, uh, and we have to, to combine the rigor of logic with the flexibility to welcome new knowledge. Uh -huh. And expression of knowledge by the by the stakeholders, by the actors, because we could be very cumbersome there for them to work in, in an industry when they just apply uh, or have uh, some already produced knowledge without understanding. Uh, yes, the uh, purpose. Yes, uh, so we have to give room like in mechanics uh, to, yeah. uh, in order that it works. Any other comments? Yeah, another point maybe on, on the value is 
let's say uh, one time I, I, I I'm discussing with the company and uh, about creating ontologies and have a knowledge base and so on. So and the engineer in this company told me, yeah, but I don't need to. I have all the knowledge. I don't need to describe this for the for for, for to have it in in the software. So I look to his boss. I say, if he goes tomorrow, you lose everything. Mm -hmm. So all the knowledge that he developed during those years in this company, it's the capital of the company. So you should to keep that. You should to formalize this and to 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 build on this knowledge, to capture and to store it and to exploit it later. So this is also a, a big point, I think, about the value and the role of ontology in this digital transformation it's not only because when talk for example in maintenance the digitalization of maintenance so it depends to the company for some companies using a cmms as is a digitalization of maintenance. Mm -hmm. for others using uh, uh, you know virtual reality in adding you know tablet with virtual this is the digitalization of maintenance mm -hmm. so the perspective can be different but which which can be common in all of this is knowledge. Yeah. So it can be exploited in different kind of, of, of digitalizations. So this is a, a, a common circle that we can use for different in, innovation in maintenance. It would yeah, extend like it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, Guys, can yeah. I just mention something really depressing before anybody else jumps in? None of this is going anywhere with industry until we have enterprise level tools that will manage the reasoning for us. So we can talk about this all we want, we can write papers, but really deploying this in industry, there are very, very few options that will manage the reasoning on, on an enterprise level. Industry is not going to use Protégé. So until we put more efforts into being able to do this on traditional enterprise architecture, we're really stuck here. Unless somebody knows a solution that I don't know about other than RDF Ox. That, that, that's, I think, why uh, Jean-Charles is, is, is developing his tool to, to be uh, within, I mean, within companies and, and to facilitate maybe tomorrow in present lesson. Yeah, it's a pleasure. We've <laughs> got a lovely guitar for you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the point I think it's also who should develop this system, right? Should researchers do this? I mean, I'm not paid to do development uh, in the software sense, right? I mean, we do research. I mean, in engineering, computer science. I mean, uh, you guys working in companies? Come on, develop the systems. <laughs> so, and make money out of it. Innovation is like the huge of books. Yeah, sure. so, I mean, from our point of view as researchers, I think that we can give like our let's say, small, uh, experience in knowledge engineering, on knowledge engineering, but developing the system themselves, that they should be software company because they have much more experience in them. Do that. Yes. Uh, no, absolutely. I'm not saying that this is. So that I agree. So would that mean that enhanced collaboration between different forms of institutions, trying to work in smaller chunks, I wouldn't call it even a chunk, but smaller bites, would that promote this better? How do we tell this to the industry? Because one of the key aspects, and, and, and I'm totally in line with you, Melinda, I'm looking at that enterprise level approach and architecture, and probably that's one of the reasons why I stand outside the community and say, how does this work? Why does this work? Why should I do this? And all of those questions. Um, but I think retaining knowledge is very important. Um, formalizing it, because if somebody creates something, they go away, that's it. Only he can do that. It's a black box. Um, sitting gathering dust, we can't do anything with it. But I would rather have it like an open platform uh, where we, we can go. And I think there's this discussion will continue. Will this level of collaborative uh, uh, initiatives uh, across the world with different groups coming along where there is that sector of ontologist, the domain expert, probably the practitioner, the end user. If there is these kind of uh, platforms, we can as a group try and approach and keep it more aware 
perhaps there is a solution there. I don't know. I'm, I'm just thinking uh, quite widely in terms of how the collaboration can be promoted, because at the end of the day, it's about uh, uh, how best we can uh, improve our efficiencies. And I go back to my term, efficiencies, um, rather than anything else. Um, any final comments, thoughts before I close the session? If I can jump in on the on the industry related comments. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I just want to point out uh, at the beginning uh, so you said who should do it, so you should hire uh, ontologists. Uh, but now we get, get, got to the conclusion also that the, the, the actual development should be done by industry, not by ontologists. So again, it's a bit of contradiction. Ontologists in companies. In companies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the true uh, Different, I think, uh, in thinking is that a company and industry need to make profit. That, that's it. So we cannot think of an industry developing something that, that at some point uh, will be used by everyone else to make a profit. This is not how yeah, normal sure. current industry works. So that's why we were kind of asking for building blocks uh, uh, or something. Uh, you also told uh, us about this uh, shielding the top levels, which Probably industry were not able neither to appreciate nor to understand fully what they are for. But if we have something of, in the form of a block to help us building from there uh, down, then the maybe. I would I would say to that that I think that is exactly the same thing that had to happen with enterprise architecture. Right? You have to get to the point, and the industry has to reach the maturity where they appreciate that you need it. And and today you have companies that have major IT teams have architecture teams that develop at that higher level. And so if that functionality to gain the benefits that you get out of ontologies via the benefit of an ontology architect, then uh, industry will have to include that in the project plans and incorporate it and find the funding. And that's obviously a question of awareness, but I think that is the level of activity where that sort of work is going to happen. And certainly we see that the larger corporations now have got a, a department called the Digital Transformation Team, but they don't talk about the levels of how they deploy or they, they look at a variety of tools and they consider, um, and I don't want to read, and I have been told this, that ontology is another tool, as opposed to uh, looking at how it can combine uh, different aspects of knowledge and how we can look at it for a long term. And rather than a very short term where I might process to sell my product, make money, show it in my quota. But I think that, that I think that is the viewpoint. And I think we need to probably there is a lot of growth for us as a community there, trying to see how we can influence it. Um, and I think that could be, um, again, uh, I'm not saying in the collaborations is the only way, but actually having those kind of ontologists trying to guide people would actually benefit. Okay. I think uh, I'll draw a close to this uh, session with that comment. Thank you very much. Sorry we were a little late. Um,